They handcuffed me and my wife out here. They wanted me to sit on the curb uh, while they were carrying this out, uh, something that I refused to do. They wanted my wife to sit on the curb out here that she refused to do. As I was coming out, this big old drone met me. organization that's done something here on the ground practically for African people is the one that's come under attack. Institution that offers a community radio station, a newspaper, a commercial kitchen, a, an Aquaba Hall rental space, and community office for our organizers. That was the building that has come under attack. African People's Socialist Party, a vanguard for the struggle for the liberation of our people. They see that because not just what we do here in the United States, but because we had the temerity to do like Garvey, to do like Malcolm X, and take the struggle of black people around the world. Uhuru comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Taught Me Sunday study, live with the leader of the African nation, Chairman Omali Eshatela. My name is Mwezi Odom, and I'm an Chairman Omali Eshatela, and I will be your MC and moderator for today's show. The theme of discussion is, hands off Uhuru, stop the FBI attacks against the African People's Socialist Party. Friday, July 
29, 2022, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, initiated a political assault against the African People's Socialist Party, the broader Uhura movement and its leader, Chairman Omali Eshetela, in the form of pre-dawn raids. This attack employed the use of dozens of tactical gear, uh, gear sporting FBI agents, battering rams, flashbang grenades, assault rifles, drones, and more. The attacks occurred in two cities where our party has prominent bases, St. Petersburg, Florida, and St. Louis, Missouri. The latter are recently established party headquarters. They were simultaneous, beginning at 5 a.m. in the Midwest and 6 a.m. on the East Coast. The attacks happened at a time when the FBI assumed our leaders would have been in a vulnerable state. And it was also an attempt to make it impossible for our leaders to connect with one another, to prepare for what was to come next. The home of Chairman Omali Eshetela and APSP Deputy Chair Onazene Eshetela in the African community of Northside St. Louis was broken into with the use of flashbang grenades, shattering windows around their house. Chairman Omali was met with laser dotting his chest with the statement, the statement that the colonial state was prepared to assassinate him at any moment. The FBI sent drones into the home and temporarily detained the leadership with handcuffs, at one point asking them to sit on the curb while they conducted their raid. Their cell phones and computers were stolen from them in the process. Across town in the white community of Southside St. Louis, the same type of attack was made against our Uhuru Solidarity Center, an institution that is a part of the Black Power Blueprint, bringing the struggle of Black power into the heart of the colonizer community. The FBI used battering rams to barrel through the doors and in apartment homes within the center, Uhura Solidarity Movement Chair Jesse Neville and USM Vice Chair Amanda Carlosi were met with assault rifle toting agents threatening them to leave the building. The colonial state showed up to the home of African People Solidarity Committee Chairwoman Penny Hess and APSP or APSC veteran Kitty Riley in the same fashion. All of these comrades had their phones and laptops taken, as well as files and, from, and other computers that were in our institutions. In St. Petersburg, Florida, St. Pete police told APSP Agiprop director, Akile Anayi, that her car had been broken into. At this point, the FBI had not made their presence known. Director Akile was instructed to check her car, at which point FBI agents circled around a corner, trapping Akile in the middle of them. Her car was raided, phone and laptop taken, as well as bank deposit bags for institutions within her department. The FBI came out in droves to the St. Pete Uhura House, a long-standing political fixture in the heart of, Saint of the city's south side Black community. They taped off the streets, preventing anyone from driving down the full length of Tyrone Lewis Avenue, or 18th Ave, similar to how they had done in 1996 when they attempted to crush our movement. Their raid lasted nine long, grueling hours, knocking us offline and able to communicate across airwaves within, uh, with the use of Black Power 96 radio. They stole entire file cabinets worth of financial records, computers, hard drives from our party's archives, and in every location, they damaged doors, light fixtures, and covered up the security cameras to hide the extent of their destruction and theft. They also raided the chairman and deputy chair's home in St. Petersburg, Florida. So to deepen the basis for such open and vicious colonial attacks, it is my honor now to introduce the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party and the International African Revolution, Chairman Omali Yeshitela. Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru. I want to uh, express my appreciation and thanks to you, Kamem Mwezi, uh, for introducing uh, this study on this morning. As you should be reminded that the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru Movement, always has, has always recognized the relationship between practice and theory. So we engage in, in studies. We've been doing this for a long period of time. Uh, trying to do what we could to help uh, members of our party, our movement, and the general uh, African population and others uh, understand uh, the conditions of our existence and to convey some uh, kind of a theoretical basis for what it is uh, that we do. But this should serve as a reminder 
that is to say, July 29th attack on our institutions and the leaders of our party, uh, that this is not pure uh, abstract uh, kind of discussions that we have. And we are not speaking as uh, people who are simply sitting on the sidelines watching history pass us by. We have come to understand that we have a responsibility that we are part of the history. The people make, are the real makers of history. And African people have been fundamental to how history has evolved for the longest period of time and it's been disrupted. The history of Africa, the history of African people, the history of the world uh, has been disrupted, has been hijacked uh, in so many ways by the advent of the colonial slavery of African people and how that has uh, transformed the world and has now en enveloped the uh, entire world. Uh, and this is what people are contending with, whether they are conscious of it or not. Women who are concerned about what happens uh, in your lives and the fact that uh, there is very little control that you have over your lives. Uh, 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 workers who have to be concerned about the uh, expropriation, expropriation of the value of your labor uh, what it is that we do and how we never, 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 never get paid for the value of our labor. Uh, and in fact, at best, we would get paid uh, for the ability to do labor. And that's at best. And most Africans don't even get paid enough to do labor, about which I mean uh, that the system has been constructed off of the enslavement of African people, uh, the development of a colonial capitalist system, a colonial mode of production that will steal the, the labor of human beings and, and put it to work. And the human beings whose labor uh, is being stolen uh, never, never, never get the value of that labor. At best, we'll get enough to reproduce our ability to come and work for the white man the next day, to work for the colonizer the next day. That's the kind of social system we're born into. And most people don't understand that. And it's, it's uh, not unreasonable that we don't understand. It's not a statement of intellectual prowess. It's not a statement of uh, our capability of understanding anything. It's a statement of how complete, almost complete, the system of control uh, under uh, colonialism uh, has been. And I just wanna say in passing this final thing before uh, getting into uh, the essence of the study that uh, all society uh, revolves around how that society acquires what it needs to live, what it needs to survive. An economic base is the foundation of all society. Uh, and, and stemming from and related to this economic base is what people refer to as a superstructure. That is to say the institutions, the ideas, the legal institution, the ideology, the philosophy is a direct relationship to how the, the society acquires what it needs to exist. And it's really important for us to understand that the society that we're talking about is a global society. And notwithstanding the uh, ongoing process of Europe and the colonizers uh, to define reality based on their, uh, their uh, geographical location, uh, uh, that's not the case. The fact is that the advent of colonial capitalism in Portugal some 600 years ago ventured out of Portugal uh, and captured the first African and began the process of selling us that created a whole new world economy. It was not a Portuguese economy. In fact, there was not a European economy. Europe didn't exist at that time. There was no concept of Europe. It was not the white man's economy. The white people didn't exist at that time. I mean, as a philosophical, an ideological, political concept, it was, the, it was this process of enslaving us and, and developing a world economy uh, that developed uh, also what we have come to know as the white man, Europe, uh, and the world economy that we suffer from. So this is the beginning of it all. And it's really important for us to understand that it's a world economy that we uh, trap with. It's not a St. Louis, North St. Louis, a St. Petersburg economy. 
It's not uh, a, a, an economy uh, that's in one of the townships uh, in South Africa or in, in Lungi, uh, in, in Sierra Leone. It's a world economy and we're all connected to it. So all of those people who try to say that what's happening in Russia, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Nicaragua, Venezuela, Iran, Iraq, have nothing to do with us. They are completely, totally misinformed or they are deliberately attempting to extract uh, and isolate African people and from the rest of the world and to isolate us from the role that we played in the development of the existing social system. We've been critical and central to it. So I wanted to say that going into this discussion. So we do want to understand July 29th and as the advanced detachment, that is to say the African People's Socialist Party, we are in the process of continuously developing a, a meaningful response to the recent brutal assault on the African People's Socialist Party by the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, an arm of the United States government. We are discussing our summation of these attacks, and everyone needs to take this overview seriously and to digest it. I think it's really important, and it helps to give context to everything that's happened with us in terms of the assault on our people through us and say it's really important and it helps to give context to everything that's happening to us in terms of the assault on our people through us and all the work that we are engaged in everywhere. It should help to inform us. And what I mean by this, by that is this. Uh, generally speaking, African people, the whole of our people are oppressed everywhere on the planet Earth. We are downtrodden, we are insulted, we are brutalized. Genocide is a constant uh, reality for us. So this happens all the time. Normally, this happens as a part of the functioning of the social system. But at that moment in history, when we see Africans who rise up and get organized and then struggle against that, then what we see is the system pays particular attention to that force that's trying to disrupt the ability of the colonial powers to kill, destroy, to keep us enslaved. That is the vanguard. And that vanguard is stands between the people and the enemy. That vanguard stands between the mass of the people uh, and the colonial capitalist system. That is the thing that they have to attack now. So they concentrate their venom. They concentrate their attack on that vanguard, that force that's moving forward to keep them from being able to do what they wanna do all the time to, the, to our people. So that's what I mean. Uh, and that's something uh, that is really uh, important to understand. So we say that, uh, that uh, that we are talking about uh, the assault on our people through us. It's us. They are attacking black people. They are attacking the oppressed, colonized peoples of the world when they attack us, the vanguard, that which is standing out in front, that which is leading the struggle to, to liberate Africa, African people, and the oppressed and exploited peoples of the world. So it wasn't just an attack in North St. Louis. It was an attack on us in Everton West and South Africa. It was an attack on oppressed people in Nicaragua and Venezuela and all over the world. That's what we are in, in looking at. And we see that there's a war machine that has been geared up trying to save this colonial capitalist system that's in action, in motion all around the world. And they want to keep each of these struggles isolated so that people do not have the ability to communicate with each other so that our discussions, our struggle, uh, or, or something that's encircled uh, by the oppressor. And so we have to rely on the white man. We have to rely on the colonizer for any solution that we're looking for. That's why they always saw uh, uh, Malcolm X as a threat because he, they say he took the struggle internationally. He took the struggle to various other places around the world. That's why Garvey was such a threat. That's why, why even Martin Luther King, uh, because he raised up the question of Vietnam and tried to show the relationship of Vietnam and what was happening to African people here and everywhere else around the world. They want to keep us isolated. They want us keep keep us relying on them. They want to keep us relying on Zuckerberg and Facebook and CBS and all of these other entities that are designed to control our discussion and our communication with each other. So uh, what has become clear is that the United States government, along with the so-called Western colonial powers under the sway and leadership of the United States, has identified three strategic contradictions that represents an existential crisis for the colonial mode of production. This crisis revolves around the question of a continued hegemony of the United States. That is to say, the United States is the big dog on the porch 
and this is a crisis because that is being challenged globally. So this crisis revolves around the question of the continued hegemony of the United States and the end of the reign of the colonial powers that came into existence through the enslavement of African people initially and attacks on other peoples. What we can see without any element of controversy is that one component of this strategic threat named by the United States government is Russia. This helps to explain the government's attack on us. China is clearly another strategic threat that is perceived by the so-called Western powers. Even before the attack on July 29th, I've been writing about this in political reports to our Congresses and to our plenaries, uh, defining this, this, this developing uh, crisis for the existing social system, the exist, existing mode of production. We see the US assault that's currently being made on Russia through Ukraine. We see the war of ideas and the daily barrage of US claims of atrocities and genocide being committed by the Russians in Ukraine. I also want to remind us that this war, this controversy, this contradiction with Russia is not new. It has taken on a different, more urgent character today, but it is longstanding. There are some who are able to acknowledge the 2014 US intervention in Ukraine that overturned the elected government. And I'm saying this because the US talks about the, its appreciation, love of elections and electoral process, and they must, be disrupt, must not be disrupted. But there are some who are able to acknowledge the 2014 US intervention in Ukraine that overturned the elected government there and that contributes to this crisis that we're looking at right now. Some are able to, to acknowledge the involvement of escalated aggression against Russia. They can see that. That's been reported on by various media sources, even within the silo of information that has been constructed to re restrict our understanding of what's happening in the world. Some can see the relationship of the current US war on Russia to the role of the Carter administration, that is James Earl Carter uh, in the 1980s, which went into Afghanistan uh, with an initiative that was actually begun by Carter's national security advisor, Zygmunt Brzezinski. Carter was determined to destroy and cripple Russia through creating this jihad, the modern jihad that people are experiencing today that we see happening throughout the world, where we talk about what's happening in Afghanistan and various other places. The modern jihad was created by the US government, the James Earl Carter administration. They are the ones who organize and train those forces and sent them into Afghanistan uh, and, and and so Carter was determined to, to manufacture a so-called Vietnam for Russia by attacking the government in Afghanistan. Although I think it can be overemphasized, that government was supported by Russia. Women in Afghanistan had rights and major social and economic progress was, was being made uh, in Afghanistan. But the US backed attack on Afghanistan, as I mentioned, was seen as providing for Russia its own Vietnam, a war that had been so crippling in, to the United States in terms of economic and political standing in the world, that is Vietnam. The US backed uh, attack on Afghanistan was also used in NATO, putting military forces closer to the Russian border. That is to say in Afghanistan that put uh, forces closer to uh, the Russian border, and part of the process of encircling uh, uh, Russia. And NATO was created in 1949 for the exact purpose of containing and destroying the, what was then called Soviet Russia. It is important to remember that the United States was among the various imperialist forces that invaded Russia in 1918, following the success of the 1917 Russian Revolution. People often refer to it as Soviet Russia because it was so designated by the revolutionary forces of the Soviet Union. The, this assault was made on Russia initially by the United States and then what we might refer to as the West. And I should say that Japan was also one of the colonial powers at that time that joined all of them in the attack on Russia in 1918. While a lot of people are able to recognize the significance of the Russian Revolution, of 1917, uh, that, that concluded in 1917. 
uh, uh, that was begun in 1914 or heated up in 1914 and reached a, a, a conclusion in 1917. So a lot of people are able to recognize the significance of the Russian Revolution. Most people, including Africans ourselves, do not remember that the Russian Revolution was significant because it broke from the rest of Europe, that is the colonial powers, that it had, that, and that it came at a time when Europe was engaged in what's often referred to as World War I. <clears throat> we refer to this war as the first imperialist world war uh, that was being fought by colonial powers to redivide the world among themselves. This is really important to understand. When you look at what they call World War I, which is a self-centered kind of definition of what the hell was going on uh, that was made by the colonial powers. This was a war that white people, white power, uh, uh, were engaged in to redivide the world. Who was going to get this part of Africa? Who was going to get this, this, this? That's what that war was fought for. And it's really important to understand that if you really want to get a sense of where we are now, what we are contending with, why, why, why my, my house was attacked on July 29th, why our center was attacked uh, uh, on July 29th and, 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 and centers in both uh, St. Louis and St. Petersburg, Florida, this is a part of the history. It's the struggle of colonized people, the struggle of Africa, the struggle of African people that thrust what came to be known as the Russian Revolution to the surface. So, uh, and this is just an absolute truth. The thing is that we haven't been able to see it because we've been looking at the world through the lenses of the colonial powers themselves. And it's only as a consequence of our becoming subjects of history through our own capture of our consciousness uh, and understanding through our own capture of, an, of, of a philosophy, an ideal, a scientific assessment of the world that we now understand is we have been in the center of this thing all along. So as African people, so it's important. We refer to this war as the first imperialist world war that was being fought by colonial powers to redivide the world among themselves, redivide black people among themselves. And this is, this is part of what it is we suffer from as a people and why we should never, ever, ever be satisfied with going back, no matter how many flashbang grenades they can come up with, or FBI attacks, or Marines, and other kinds of forces that's attacking black people. As, as African people, we have experienced this many times ourselves, including in Berlin in 1884 and 85, when the colonial powers got together to carve up Africa uh, among themselves. Historically, you can see many other instances when the great powers of Europe have come together to reshape the world, to make it something that satisfied their own particular interests. If you uh, were a relatively good student in whatever colonial school you went to, you have never been satisfied with what the hell was being put forward as the cause of that first imperialist world war. Uh, the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Okay. Uh, that just never made sense. There was nothing that was said that could help us understand the basis of that war. It's really important for us to understand that what that we are talking about a time frame where anti-colonial movements and struggles were raging throughout the world, throughout the world. This is the context that we are talking about, the rise of the Russian Revolution, the rise of Lenin and all those, and Trotsky and all those forces. It was war, a raging struggle of colonized people around the world that created this crisis where they, where Russia, we'll say more about that. Uh, and so uh, it's really important for us to understand that we are talking about a time frame where anti-colonial movements and struggles were raging throughout the world and the imperialists recognized the need to crush the motion of the colonized. The Russian Revolution of 1917 happened in the context of the 1915 U.S. invasion in, in Haiti by the U.S. Marines who located, who looted Haiti of everything they had during the same time frame. There were attacks by the United States and Nicaragua and Venezuela. You saw struggles that were happening in the Middle East and all over the world. People were trying to win their freedom and the French and the British uh, were dividing up what is now called the regions of the Middle East. There was the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. But you know, if you just look at the United States and like that same time frame period, the red, the red terror of 1915, 1916, 17, 18, 19, 21, when they dropped the bomb on black people in, in, in Oklahoma. If this was colonial people who they were crushing and destroying, and we've accepted their definition of reality and could not see our own significance in this whole struggle. Now we can. 
Now we can, and this is one of the struggles and problems that they have. So it was the time of the movement of Marcus Garvey who achieved such an extraordinary influence in the world with his organization of 11 million African people globally. See, many African people who say they appreciate Garvey, they say Garvey had the greatest black organization of black person, da, 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 da. that can be, yes, he did that. But he didn't just have a black organization. He had a black organization in a world that was dominated by colonial powers in the context of a colonial mode of production. He was mobilizing black people all around the world, including India and Australia, everywhere we were located. This was a serious threat to the existing social system. It was not just some internal black thing that we were just doing among ourselves. Uh, it was something that challenged the entire world. In fact, if you look at some of the FBI documents at, from that time, the first place, the FBI integrated itself. The first Negro was brought into the FBI in order to, have, so they needed somebody to infiltrate the, the Garvey movement. They needed a black person to go into the movement of Garvey. I think it's really, really important, you know, for us to understand this, to contextualize this with, uh, within the whole uh, uh, realm, the whole uh, uh, process of history, you know, articulating itself uh, 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 as from the vantage point of the oppressed but the oppressor was the one who was defining what was happening, not us. Garvey was one who was trying to do that, was doing that successfully until they, the FBI uh, integrated, like I said, by an African person. Uh, but the other thing is you look at some of the documents, you will see that they were saying, uh, this is the time Sun Yat-sen in Japan, uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh <clears throat> uh, uh, from Vietnam, uh, revolutionary struggles happening uh, uh, throughout uh, Mexico, uh, 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 Zapata, uh, 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 people like uh, uh, Pancho Villa in Mexico, uh, a revolutionary forces happened in Nicaragua, all of these moves, and, and the Garvey's newspaper, the Negro World, was actually the organ that was used by the revolution that was happening in Nicaragua, uh, because they, it was written in three languages, and, and, and some of the language, the FBI agents who who saw this paper coming into Nicaragua, they disregarded, didn't pay any attention to it. But, but this is the way the Nicaraguan revolution uh, was able to get uh, 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 some understanding of some unity with the rest of the world through what Garvey was doing. And you will see in the retrieved documents that FBI agents were reporting that every time that these people who were fighting internationally, they would come to New York and report to Garvey to Garvey. <clears throat> he was not just some kind of guy wearing a funny looking hat, uh, just somebody who uh, is represented as, the, as uh, some kind of, uh, 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 some kind of a prophet uh, for black people. He was one of the most significant anti-imperialist forces in the world. He, he, there were more uh, chapters and branches of the UNIA that under the leadership of Marcus Garvey than there were of the communist international or the communist movement spread throughout the world. That's the significance of the anti-colonial and this, your significance. This is the thing that helps to explain what happened on July 29th uh, to our movement. So we say uh, it was uh, the time of the movement of Marcus Garvey who, who achieved such an extraordinary influence in the world but this is an organization of 11 million African people globally. While the discussion was happening at the League of Nations about who was going to get <clears throat> what parts of Africa, this is the part of the discussion to redivide the world. Who was going to get what? This is white people that's, they're among themselves saying who was going to get what part of Africa. And this is the time that Garvey was demanding Africa for Africans at home and abroad. This helps to contextualize that statement. It was just not, it was not some narcissistic statement that Garvey was making to black people, Africa for Africans at home and abroad. He was saying this in the context of the white nations of the world dividing up or the white nation of the world dividing up parts of Africa and the rest of the world. Africa for Africans. This was the statement that came from Marcus Garvey. So the point that I am I'm making is that the Russian Revolution was thrust into motion by the struggles of the colonized peoples of Africa and other places on the planet. If you talk about modern progressive history and the significance of this period, it's not the Russian Revolution that is the beginning. The process that gave birth to the Russian Revolution was the struggle of colonized people around the world to break out of the situation that had been imposed on us by the colonial mode of production. No one talks about colonialism being the driving force except for the African People's Socialist Party. We've always worked to understand the superstructure and ideology that stems from the colonial mode of production. 
the colonizers are those that define and shape what the superstructure would look like. By superstructure, I mean the ideas, the ideology, which is a kind of cultural reflection of the colonial mode of production. So it's important to understand that this, that this is the context in which Russia became the enemy of the United States because regardless of its intent, what Russia was talking about was the workers of the world and the oppressed peoples of the world. So regardless of what its intent, and I'm not even talking about them. This must be understood by everybody because people or some person who is supposed to be a leader of a, some black organization was saying something about the whole Russian Ukraine question and he could never support Russia because there are some Russians who live in Pittsburgh uh, live uh, in particular cities uh, who own stores and they're rude to black people. I'm not talking about that. I'm not even talking about what Russians were thinking in their head when they were in motion. I'm talking about an objective relationship that all of us have to an existing social system. We have to understand that social system and we have to understand what's being said by representatives of that social system within the context of the relations of power that exists in the world at any given time. That's who we are. That's what we say. We say our movement has to be guided by science and scientific understanding of reality as opposed to what somebody thinks about us. They don't like us anyway. That's got nothing to do with, I don't care who likes us. I'm not, in a, I'm not looking for a love affair. I mean, I'm over that love affair thing and, 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 and I'm engaged now in trying to deal with this objective reality that has been imposed on us as enslaved people. What will it take to break out of that? Whether we have a love affair or not, how do we get the hell out of this situation? How do we lead our people out of that? That's for the African People's Socialist Party. So Russian communists assumed that there was going to be this great revolution and movements coming out of Western Europe and, and it did not happen. Uh, the only revolutionary activity that was challenging imperialism in the biggest possible way was the anti-colonial struggles taking place worldwide. It's really important to say that. The basic point is that the struggle with Russia has a long history that didn't just start yesterday. Subsequent to that, of course, we have a situation where Russia now is a challenge to the US because it has broken from the trajectory of the colonial powers. That's what happened in 1917. That's what happened after the Russian Revolution. It did not participate on the same trajectory of the colonial powers, which was simply attempting to replicate uh, in some other iteration, the same social system that, that of, uh, and, and relations of power, uh, 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 same uh, structures uh, in the existing oppressive and exploitive system. It is Russia that is, is attempting to establish a new kind of social system uh, uh, separate, independent, and contradictory to the colonial powers and the path they have created. This is the basis for this isolation of Russia by all the colonial capitalists and, and the attempt to bring it down in that fashion. During the Second Imperialist World War, World War II, uh, also a war to redivide the world between the colonial powers, Russia came under assault. Russia was recruited to participate in the program to fight against fascism in the form of one colonial power, Germany. Japan also participated in attacking Russia in 1918. The isolation of Russia forced the Soviet Union, that is Soviet Russian, if you will, into a temporary alliance between Stalin and Hitler until Germany invaded Russia, when despite losing 23 million people uh, the Soviets, that is Soviet Russia, defeated Hitler's army. That's where Hitler uh, was defeated in Russia uh, by Russian troops, not by American troops, by Russian troops, not looking for whomever it was, the, the Tom Hanks and this movie was all about, uh, you know, uh, uh, that glorifies and the second imperialist world war. It was Russia that crushed them after losing 23 million people in the process of doing that. So during this time, the United Nations was created because the League of Nations didn't suffice in part because the United States was not a member of the League of Nations, though it is the initiator of the League of Nations. The creation of the United Nations was a consolidation of a new world order that, that happened in the 1940s and that has lasted for some 70 odd years up to now. From this, the U.S. formed NATO in 1949 as an entity. This is North Atlantic Treaty Organization, acronym NATO, uh, as an entity that would crush Russia because Russia was still on this path, which articulated support for workers and colonized people and overturning the colonial social system. I'm not singing the praises of Russia. Russia has been shut out of the world economy by the colonizers, and so it served the interests of Russia to be able to unite with people who were colonized and winning our freedom. The Russian socialist communist ideology 
taught it to be independent of the capitalist world economy. Russia needed access to resources that were going to the colonial capitalists. This is not to negate the integrity of the Russian revolution, but it is a reality that must be addressed because the world is not driven by some pristine or abstract theory. Material interest drives the world. We are materialists. This is not a criticism of Russia. It's just a fact that we need to be able to understand. And we have criticized Russia, I should say this, in the past. We have criticized the Soviet Union in the past. Uh, we have felt that its actions at different times were opportunistic because they were actions which were designed to project and protect the interests of the Soviet state as opposed to the other workers and colonized peoples around the world. We've made that criticism. I'm not even now talking about the intent of the Russians so much as I'm talking about the objective relationships that have existed at any given time uh, in our struggle. So, uh, so I wanted to say that uh, this is how the Soviet Union developed. And then later on, there was the US orchestrated collapse of the Soviet Union. Russia did not enter to enter modernity through the colonial process, including the assault on Africa, as did France or Germany or the United States, etc. It entered uh, modernity as a consequence of the Russian Revolution, the Communist Revolution, the Socialist Revolution of Russia that took place on the platform of the colonial resistance that was shaking the world. The world was being shaken at this moment. It was all of the relationship that existed between the colonial peoples and power were uh, up for grabs, were being, were being uh, shattered. And is, this is the context within which the Russian revolution occurred. It took advantage of a deep, profound crisis that had, had uh, come upon the world as a consequence of colonized peoples everywhere fighting for our freedom. And so therefore, even though the reality is that the colonial capitalist system is the dominant system of the world with the world economy revolving around it, Russia was able to enter into this colonial mode of production on its own terms, not as a servant, not as a proxy or minion of the, uh, minion of the US or so-called Western imperialism. Uh, Russia was able to chart its own course through this process. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about a conscious opportunism or uh, anything on the part of Russia, what I'm saying is none of them understood the colonial mode of production. That's the Russians too. Russia is now trying to survive within the context of a global economy that revolves around the colonial mode of production. So the second named strategic enemy, Russia one, the second named strategic enemy of the United States is China. Right now this crisis, they targeted Russia, they targeted China. All you gotta do is open up a newspaper, go to social media, you're gonna see some attack on China, some, China, something about China being this and that, et cetera. Similarly, China came into modernity through the Chinese revolution, not through neo-colonialism like you see in most of Africa, most of the Americas and what have you, much, uh, uh, and even in the Middle East, the Chinese shut their country down and shut the imperialists out. They shut out the colonizers to the extent that Mao Zedong is criticized today. He was the chairman of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. He was criticized today uh, because instead of trying to go through the capitalist process as Marxism uh, had taught, uh, explained uh, in terms of development uh, uh, of society, instead of, of trying to uh, go through the capitalist process that presupposed uh, the uh, uh, development of the industrial capitalist class and industrial working class, Mao tried to kick off what he called the Great Leap Forward, where the Chinese would use everything to escalate the process of development. It didn't work, uh, couldn't work ultimately, but China had valuable resources, including the Chinese Communist Party, that united China against all external aggression. And it had a billion people, and the people, the workers, and the peasants are the producers. China was, a, was seen by the colonial powers as producers of life for Europe, for white people and the United States, just like black people do everywhere around the world. So the US saw China as something that they could penetrate as they did in 1972 with the Nixon Kissinger venture when they made this rapprochement uh, with China. This was part also of the struggle against Russia. When Russia, when Kissinger and Nixon engaged in this relationship with China, it was to break up the relationship or disrupt the relationship or deepen the contradiction that existed between China and Russia, both of whom were supposed to be this uh, uh, serious uh, communist uh, 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 countries. This was uh, part of the struggle against Russia and they tried to create greater divisions between Russia and China and continue to work to isolate the Soviet Union. 
The U.S. wanted to have access to all these working people, these peasants and workers and China and whatever resources were in China itself. They wanted to turn a billion people organized with the advantage of what was, had been brought to them by the Chinese Communist Party into producers of life for Europe and white power. All this was seen as a gold mine. So they brought all kinds of resources into China. The US did, colonial powers did. They brought all kinds of resources into China for that purpose, but China took those resources and transformed the conditions on the ground for themselves, for China. Uh, the Europeans and white power could not envision this because the colonial mode of production has taught them that white people are the smartest people in the world and that the Chinese were all these nasty names that they call, that they, the colonizers, call Chinese. They have defined the Chinese in a way that serves their interests, their interpretation of history. So they couldn't believe that they could be outsmarted, uh, outfoxed by the Chinese. So they took all these uh, resources into China with the purpose of exploiting China. And uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm working some stuff happening with my computer. But China built an extraordinary economy and extraordinary power. <laughs> this created consternation for them up to today. So when they see China and Russia, they see two strategic enemies that's shaking the whole world, the political, economic, and power configuration of the world. Uh, they are being transformed right now as we have this discussion. We're talking right now the political, economic, and power uh, configuration of the world uh, uh, is being challenged right now. At the, at the same time, Africa was central to the emergence of the colonial capitalist system to begin with. Would be no colonial capitalist system. I don't care what Marx said about how so development was supposed to happen, but we see practically, we can, we can measure it. We, uh, uh, effectively, there is concrete evidence that can be documented that the capitalist system has its origin in the attack on Africa, the theft of our resources, both human and material. I am in St. Louis now because white power attacked Africa and dragged us and threw us all around the world to create value and wealth for it, for colonialism, for the colonial mode of production. So you see this huge contest that's going on around Africa that's not being addressed by anybody, anybody. You can read all of these uh, brilliant uh, ex essays and discussions and, and, and the most important influential kinds of, of uh, ideological uh, journals that's produced by the ruling class themselves, not just in the United States, but around the world. You see uh, 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 foreign affairs. That's one of the most uh, significant uh, bourgeois uh, publications. This is where the bourgeoisie is talking to itself. They're not talking about Africa uh, in this way, except who's going to get Africa, whether it's going to be China or Russia, uh, or, or whether it's going to be China or the United States, who's going to dominate the world. We're not even factored into it in that way, in that way. So nobody's talking about Africa, but it doesn't mean that Africa is not significant. It doesn't mean that they don't recognize the significance of Africa. So let's see. So you see this huge contest that's going on around Africa that's not being addressed by anybody really. China is the fastest economic force in Afri Africa, fastest growing economic force in Africa. And Russia is viewed by many in Africa as an ally because it has a history of providing some support for independence and liberation uh, uh, and, and, and the liberation struggles. And these liberation struggles were being made against the colonial powers of Europe and America. So, so Russia has, uh, if the masses of African people are, are different people, forces in Africa see Russia as a friend, it's because they got some kind of support from Russia uh, against the colonial domination of uh, Africa by, by white power. So Russia uh, offered support at different times. Russia is contesting with France and has made itself available in other aspects of struggle in the Middle East. Africa is such a central force and, is, and, and it is this, and, and it is this critical for the United States. We can list most of the resources that are being stolen from Africa and which are necessary for the function of a modern economy. The economy that has been shaped uh, under this colonial capitalist system through the colonial mode of production. This economy born of the assault on Africa requires all of these assets that come from Africa. And when they say all of the assets that come from Africa, those are the people, who, black people who sweep the, sweep the streets in, in Paris, France. 
Uh, those are the black people who live in hovels uh, in modern Amsterdam. Uh, uh, those of us who live in, in North uh, St. Louis and various other places around the world, those are Africa's resources being deployed by the enemies of Africa. So this economy born of the salt on Africa requires all of these assaults. This whole world economy born of the assault on Africa requires all of these assets that come from Africa. That's just an objective reality. It can't function without Africa's stolen resources. The US wouldn't have anything without those resources. Africa has been a central force in the world economy. Today, Africa is extraordinarily unstable in the sense that the people are without the leadership of the party uh, and are fighting desperately to survive, just to live, and against those political forces that are blocking the process of the production of life for Africa and in Africa. The neocolonial forces in Africa are in a situation, when we say neocolonial forces, we're talking about that white power in black face in Africa, uh, who serve to transfer Africa's wealth uh, et cetera, from Africa to Europe and to what is now known as America. So the neocolonial forces in Africa are in a situation where the changing power configuration of the world have made it possible for them uh, to be able to conceive of not being total lick spittles for France or for the United States. Now they have become lick spittles for Russia and China. Uh, it's not like they've decided that they're going to be great revolutionaries, generally speaking but they feel like they've been inspired to break from the total domination of the traditional Western colonial powers. And that's the problem. Because even though they may be lick spittles and whatever, they're tired of being treated like lick spittles. So if they can, if they can engage uh, with a power that will call them Mr. Nigger and just instead of nigger, if they can get some kind of respect and not be treated like, uh, like uh, in the terrible ways that African people have treated by white power, the colonial forces, then that's one aspect of it. That's just one aspect of it. Russia and China have intervened in Africa in a relatively complex way, uh, affecting the situation in Africa. China has millions of Chinese people living in Africa, living in Africa. Uh, masses of African people are struggling to change their circumstances affecting the political reality in Africa. Masses of African people are trying uh, to change their circumstances, rising up and engaging in uprisings and struggles on a regular basis. The US reveals itself by creating an African four-star general, four-star Marine general for the first time in its 246 year history. Listen, the US has created for the first time in its 246 year history, the United States Marines has given a fourth a star, a fourth star uh, to a black Marine, a four star black Marine general. Uh, first time in the history of 246 years of the existence of the Marine Corps, first time. And what do they do with him? They put him in charge of AFRICOM, which is the war against Africa and the war against all the other forces who are contending with the United States in Africa the name of, of the four-star general is Michael Andrea. And you're supposed to salute that because it shows some progress with the United States because they immigrated the Marines. Now they got a black general. Now you got a four-star general for the first time. It's their general. It's their general to work against black people, black power and against Africa. That must be understood. We're trying to sum up what we're looking at in the world today. Three strategic enemies that have been identified by the United States government, Russia, China, Africa is one of them always been a, a critical force, but they haven't had to deal with Africa since Garvey in the same and in Kruan and Lumumba uh, 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 since uh, what it is that uh, they happen to contend with now. So a great threat to imperialism is the fact uh, that it has dispersed colonized people all around the world. These people are cleaning the streets, washing dishes, etc. cetera. Uh, they are at the airport checking your luggage and stuff like that. When you come through the security, uh, often you find colonized people who are carrying out this role for imperialism and whether they recognize it or not, that's a critical uh, kind of security threat that's right there in their house, in their ranks and et cetera. So, the colonized, we do, play an extraordinary role inside the colonizers' countries of US, France, England, et cetera. The colonized are the ones who are at the airport checking your documents to make sure they're good. The colonized play an extraordinary role inside the colonial countries and also they play a role that's constantly engaged in some kind of fight for democracy as it is perceived from the perspective of the colonial powers themselves. 
So in England and in France and the United States, you see Africans and other colonized people are struggling for rights. This is a consequence of colonized people being dispersed throughout the colonial powers. This helps to shake up the entire system all the time. It's involved in having to deal with this kind of contest of the colonized in their countries, even though they might call them Afro-French or they might call them uh, Black Brits, et cetera, but they brought, they, they brought the colonial contradiction inside their own countries as opposed to simply being able uh, to control us and rule from afar. The United States is the faltering hegemon of the world. And is directly and is directing all of the chaos and all of the oppression and wars against colonial peoples. This is the connection that the African People's Socialist Party has to the question of Africa, which is also one of the st three strategic opponents that the United States has the, has identified and that has solved the problem of African people. It's time to fight for ourselves in the Ivory Coast and Haiti and in St. Louis. The party has begun the process of building and the reconsolidated African nation so that we are conscious of our interests as a whole nation of people. The party has also provided so many ideological or political solutions to the contradictions that have been imposed on Africa. And thereby what you see is the convergence of all these interests and contradictions that the United States is dealing with in China and in Russia and in North St. Louis. Uh, we see the convergence of unity uh, of unity of interests of these forces that warranted the attack on the African People's Socialist Party in July 29. In 1969, the FBI said that the Black Panther Party was the greatest internal threat to the United States. This made sense because African people are the founding block of the system. There should be no mystery about that. It is a and and there is a mystery because we have been beaten and browbeaten and and slandered and made to believe our own insignificance. We can't even imagine sometimes the central role that we have played in history and the construction of this entire thing. Once you understand that you are the ones who constructed it, once you understand the central role that you have in the system itself, then you understand what it will take to bring it down so that we can be free. And this is a critical question that's always under assault by us. They didn't kill Martin Luther King because he ever had a gun, because he had a relationship with Russia, because he uh, uh, was a bank robber or baby rapist or anything like that. They killed him because of what he was saying when he initiated the Poor People's Campaign, when he talked about the relationship of Vietnam to what was happening to African people in Mississippi. They didn't kill Malcolm X because he ran around with guns saying shoot the white man or something like that. They like to characterize Malcolm as being anti-white, which was logical and sensible <laughs> for any African in the world who experienced what white power has imposed on them. They killed Malcolm X because he took an anti-colonial stance and began to organize black people, African people around the world and not just around the world, but in connection with the struggles of other people. It was Mark Malcolm X who taught us of the significance of the Vietnamese revolution. It was Malcolm X who talked about Dinh Binh Phu and the defeat of the French there. It was Malcolm X who talked about the Mao Mao and Kenya and what have you. Malcolm did that. They killed Malcolm because of what he said, because he was breaking us out of this silo uh, that has been imposed on us as a colonized people. So it says that, uh, uh, so if you want to understand what's happening in the, in, 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 what, what happened, it is that United, what happened on the 29th, it is of June, uh, of, of July rather, uh, it is uh, that the United States government has recognized that there is an advanced detachment of African people that goes beyond the shores of the United States, but extends throughout Africa and much of the world. That's the basis of the attack. That's the basis of the attack. And it's saying, niggas, you don't, you don't have a relationship with nobody. You don't do nothing. You, don't, you just obey white boss and, and, and rely on the white boss, whether it's liberals or anything else, to define or whatever, they, whatever they call themselves, to define your relationship, to contain uh, your struggle and your consciousness, your brains, and how you should uh, interpret anything in the world. So, uh, so you, you have to understand that the United States government has recognized that there is an advanced can, uh, a detachment, an advanced detachment, a vanguard of African people that goes beyond the shores of the United States, but extends throughout Africa and much of the world. This is the basis of the attack. This is an entirely different place than in 1969, when the Black Panther Party uh, 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 was declared uh, by the head, the executive director, of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, as the greatest 
threat to the internal security of the United States, not Russia, not China, black people. Uh, uh, this is not just about the stand against the war, US war on Russia. It is much bigger. This should inform us how we move forward, how we organize everything. There are a few other points that we have to understand here. Marx was wrong. Let me say it again. Marx was wrong. I know that's like blasphemy to say Marx was wrong uh, is, to, is to curse the Bible or something like that. But Marx was wrong uh, about what it was going to take to create the communist society that he talked about. On the one hand, he was able to say that all capitalist activity rests upon the foundation of colonialism or, as he put it, slavery, pure and simple. Consequently, there were many people from Vietnam, China, Russia, and elsewhere who accepted that somehow the global communist revolution was going to be made as a consequence of a victory of the industrial working class over the industrial ruling class or capitalist class. According to this logic, the colonizers were going to make a determination of what the, the colonizers were going to make a determination of what the future was going to look like. And I think it's important to understand this. We talk about Marx and we talk about Lenin. We're talking about people who are part of the colonizer nation. Regardless of what we think of them, it's not, I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to use pejoratives or something like that to define them. This is just an objective reality. That's why I'm saying that we move from this subjectivism and understand objectively what the truth is. Marx was a part of a colonial nation. He was trying to understand, define the world from the perspective and standpoint of the colonizer. Malcolm X once correctly said, that if you want to understand what it is to be uh, uh, on a, uh, sitting on a hot stove, you get a different explanation from somebody sitting on the stove from, than you get from somebody who's watching somebody sitting on the stove. We are sitting on the stove. We are defining this reality as opposed to Marx or anybody else. Marx was able to write this incredibly significant book, uh, Capital, uh, as a consequence of getting money being kept alive and fed and clothed uh, by his friend, Frederick Engels. Frederick Engels' daddy uh, was a capitalist. Frederick Engels' daddy gave Engels money. Frederick Engels' daddy got much of the money that he gave to Karl Marx from black people who were picking cotton, who were uh, 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 in the Caribbean. So even as Marx was defining our reality, he, in writing about it in books, uh, in, in institutions that were created as a consequence of black sweat and blood, uh, uh, the, he was able to write about it because of money he was getting from uh, colonial capitalism, black people in, 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 uh, uh, in the Caribbean. Black people in the Caribbean didn't need Marx to tell us what the hell was happening to us. We knew what the hell was happening to us. And I'm not dismissing the significance of Marx. What I am saying is that we look at the world as, as, and as, as many of these people call themselves Marxists claim to do as a materialist. There's a material relationship that existed in the world. We've come up with an analysis of that reality based on material examination of reality, not on our affection or affectation, our affection of Marx or anybody else. Y'all with me? I hope so. So, uh, so, but at this point where a slave accepts, uh, let's see, uh, uh, according to this logic, the colonizer, uh, colonizers were going to make a determination of what the future was going to look like. Some of the colonizers were workers and some of the colonizers were capitalists. But they all owe their existence, workers and capitalists, uh, to colonialism, to what they stole from Africa and from everybody else around the world. Whether they call themselves fascists, whether they call themselves liberals, whether they call themselves communists or what have you, they were all part of the colonizer nation. And most of the definition that they have applied to themselves as fascists, liberals, and communists had to do with a contest that they were making with each other. They were making with each other for control of the, so, of the resources that come from the colonizers, from us. Now we define our reality for ourselves and that's intolerable to a lot of people. A lot of the colonizers who call themselves FBI agents, who call themselves the Justice Department, who call themselves the Communist Party USA, who call themselves to all kinds of things. This is our reality. We have to take control of it. And the African Fever Socialist Party has been the vanguard of that struggle, creating a philosophy, uh, defining, creating, bringing science to the struggle uh, that would help the oppressed and African people see the way forward as opposed to being trapped within this silo 
of, 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 of information that has been uh, imposed on us. So we say, uh, but at the, at the point where a slave accepts this definition, as the definition is coming from the colonial powers, you cannot win your liberation. We always hear about the struggles at the point of production and the point of production is white. We always hear about the struggles at the point of production. We've been taught that those who have adopted the Marxist understanding, et cetera, in particular, but not just that, uh, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the struggle is centered at the point of production. Uh, and communists are always telling us the point of production is where the value is, that this is the basis of the fundamental contradiction facing what they characterize as the working class. But the reality is, before materials get to the point of production, black people have died by the thousands in mines in South Africa and other places, bringing these resources up. All colonizers stand, owe their conditions of existence to the colonizers. So by the time they get to the point of production, which the Marxists say is fundamental contradiction, the true parasitism and the true class questions are no longer seen. It's not even observed. The children who were being enslaved in the cocoa plantation in Ghana and Ivory Coast and other places were not at the point of production. The point of production was in Hershey, Pennsylvania and other places where they were transforming the raw materials using modern technology that technology that they created as a consequence of colonial domination. Or another thing that is so profoundly significant is the recognition of the colonial mode of production, the colonial mode of production, the colonial mode of production, say it with me, colonial mode of production, because what part of what this explains for us is the existence of the African People's Solidarity Committee and the Uhuru Solidarity Movement under the party's leadership. It means that for the first time in history, there's a real possibility for genuine international class struggle, uh, especially inside the United States, but not just in the United States. APSC, the African People's Solidarity Committee, lays the basis for how white people can be engaged in class struggle, because we say the class struggle is concentrated in the colonial question. That this fight that white people have among themselves, they call class struggle, is simply a contest of which sector of the white population is going to get the advantage of what they're stealing from Africa and the rest of the world. So uh, usually when people talk about class struggle, they are referring to the contest as being made by white people for greater access to the colonial booty from the looting of the colonized. Even the struggle against what they call fascism is about a debate between different sectors of the white population about the inability to access and control the colonial resources. That's the struggle among the colonizers themselves. What the party has done in creating the solidarity movement is give the colonizers an opportunity to break from colonialism, just like the attempt by the Russian Revolution in 1917 when they broke with the, the tried to break with the whole capitalist mode of production and uh, et cetera. They can join the anti-colonial revolution, the anti-imperialist revolution of the world. This is what allowed Russia to break free from the traditional colonial process. Well, African internationalism, with the African internationalism party, the party through our work identifies and challenges the colonial mode of production and then allows white people to break from it. Otherwise they are stuck with this subjective trap about racism. The struggle is to make you like me. That's what the white people will have us fighting about. Yeah, you're struggling against my racism. You're struggling against the fact I don't like you. Oh, you must be out of your mind. You know, the moment we capture our own brains, our own consciousness, which is what African internationalism helps Africans and the colonized people to do, we don't have to deal with that no more. No more blue, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what are these things you put in your eyes and what have you to make them look, uh, uh, you know, to see better with uh, no, no blue contact lenses and and all this other kind of stuff to be white. We don't have to do that. We 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 are Africans, and and the center of the development of human history, human life, human civilization, and central to the con existing of the social system that it, that is here now. That's why we find intolerable five o'clock awakening by FBI agents or any other white power force attacking black people there, whether it's here, whether it's in Congo, where they captured and murdered uh, Lumumba under the direction of John F. Kennedy and, and, and David Dwight Eisenhower, cut him up in little pieces and 
put him in vats of acid and burn his body so there'll never be any evidence that this black man stood up and stood up for Africa. And what did they say about Lumumba? He was working with the Russians. What did they say about most of us in modern history when we, they even include, even suggested other people who tried to liberate our people because somehow they've created this, this, whole, this whole notion uh, that comes from this superstructure, the ideas, ideology and says that black people are too stupid and ever all the white people are, are being conditioned, have been conditioned to believe this. The niggas couldn't have come up with this in North St. Louis, where we're extracting all the value, where we're stealing all their property, where we are robbing them and create this so-called Del Mar divide. Black people in Africa who were running around with monkeys and eating bananas and being, being chased by Tarzan couldn't have come up with our own revolutionary movement. Somebody else had to bring, to it, bring it to them. This is the logic that they impose. And so when they kill us, when they come to our house and attack our house and even violating their own constitutional rules, they can say, we're not fighting against black people. We're not fighting the former slaves who have transformed North St. Louis where people are living in garbage and being insulted by every aspect of life. We're not fighting against them. We're fighting against Russians. And, and yet not only are we fighting against Russians, we're fighting against, against Russians. We're fighting against Russians who don't live in St. Petersburg, Florida. We're fighting against Russians who don't live in North St. Louis. We're fighting against Russians who are in Russia. This is what they're putting forth. And you're supposed to be dumb enough to believe that. And I think there may be a handful of people who are dumb enough to believe it. Most people who say they believe it don't believe it. They just need an excuse to be against the African Revolution, sometimes as Black people themselves. So, uh, also, I want to say that we have to understand what our responsibility is. It's a weight that's on our shoulders. What I've been trying to expose for the longest period of time is the centrality of the African Revolution and the African People's Socialist Party as the vehicle to make the African Revolution. We must recognize the centrality of African people and African internationalism as a philosophical guide for where it is that we want to go. That's what I want us to appreciate. This will help us to understand that this is an entirely different place from 1969 with the Black Panther Party. This is an entirely different, this is entirely different from just trying to crush dissent in the United States. Some people say well, anytime there's dissent, you know, the, the government attacks. This is different from that. This is uh, different from the anti-war protests being crushed, crushed or some assumption that the reason they attacked us is because of our understanding on Russia, the Ukraine war or something to that effect. It's much different from that. It's much bigger uh, because there are all kinds of people in the United States who are opposed to this war. And some of them are in support of Russia, but the African People's Socialist Party bore the brunt of this, this assault. And I just tried to lay out what I believe is the political historical basis for that. This should inform how we move forward. Uhuru, ease way late to Wow. <laughs> Uhuru chairman, Uhuru yeah. comrades. Um, Uhuru, I just really want to salute that incredible overview and um, express unity, total unity with what you've laid out. You know, this is why uh, the theory of African internationalism is so essential because you just made 600 plus years of so-called social geopolitical history like crystal clear and you laid out the rise and the fall of imperialism, but not just as something that just happened because white people are superior or, you know, all these ideas, but because, you know, you put African people in the center of that. And, you know, this puts us on the offensive, you know, knowing that we have, um, you know, what we need, which is the vehicle to overturn the colonial mode of production, which you have coined. So I really hope people took notes and come back to this later because now is the time that we really use everything that the chairman is talking about, not just to sound smarter or more informed, but to really use this truth to fight ideological imperialism, colonialism, and put into practice what African internationalism calls us to do. So uh, there's a lot of excitement, Chairman, from people watching. And we know it's something that, um, you know, there's been a lot of support for the party since this attack. So we're gonna take a moment to hear from those comrades watching live with us in our Q&A session. But first we're gonna go to um, our announcements. Uhuru. 
All right. So uh, the Bernie Spear newspaper presents a special online event during its uh, during Black August campaign, uh, which is going on now through August 30, August 31st. Uh, this is called You Can't Jail the Revolution, Free Em All. This will feature a panel discussion as well as cultural performances honoring our political prisoners and the African liberation struggle. This event takes place Saturday, August 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So you can reserve your spot now by registering at tinyurl.com slash freeamall2022. On September 2nd uh, to the 4th, next slide, thank you. Uh, attend the 2022 Impedum Convention with the theme, Defending the Black Community. We are our own liberators. The convention is taking place at Aquaba Hall in St. Louis, Missouri, and you can register at impedum2022.eventbrite.com. Visit the new website, handsoffuhuru.org. This is the central place online where you can find information about the attacks and learn what you can do to support, including organizing an action or donating to the Legal Defense Fund. Uh, you can get updates on the Hands Off for Huru campaign and um, read solidarity statements and media coverage. So visit handsoffuhuru.org. On November 5th and 6th, join the Black is, Black, Black is Back Coalition for the 14th annual Black People's March on the White House in Washington, DC. For more information, and you can register at blackisbackcoalition.org. And make sure you like and subscribe to the Bernie Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of Omali Taught Me Sunday Study and support the Omali Taught Me show by donating now at paypal.me slash Omali Taught Me. Uhuru Tours and Speakers Bureau is an institution of the African People's Socialist Party that coordinates events and tours with Chairman Omali Ashitela and other party speakers and leaders. Book Omali Ashitela and other Uhuru Movement speakers for your campus or your organization now. You can do this by emailing info at uhuratours.com or you can call 727-914-3621. And you can check out all upcoming Uhura Movement events at theburningspear.com slash events. So keep in touch with us that way. And lastly, um, we want to just now welcome everybody to come off the sidelines and to join under the leadership of the African working class led by the um, African People's Socialist Party with the solution to every question needed to make this revolution happen. You can visit APSPUhuru.org to fill out our contact form or type in the chat section right now that you want to become a member of the African People's Socialist Party. We have uh, comrades in the chat section that are waiting to get, it, to get you in touch with somebody in your region or a local organizer. So just go ahead and write, I want to join the APSP or go to APSPUhuru.org slash join it uh, slash join. You know, no matter where we're located, if you're an African who wants to see the end to this social system and be a part of building this new system, become once again a self-governing people, join the African People's Socialist Party and go to APSPUhuru.org slash join right now. All right, comrades. So uh, we're going to uh, go ahead and take questions from our online uh, uh, people who are in the audience and um, and online. But before we do that, we just want to acknowledge, um, Chairman, where our viewers are tuning in from. So we have um, people tuning in from um, Occupy Azania in South Africa. We also have Bermuda in the Caribbean. In California, we have Los Angeles uh, and San Diego. We have comrades in the Congo as well joining us. Miami, Florida, Fort Myers, uh, Florida, Gainesville, and Palm Harbor, Florida. Augusta, Florida, Marion County, uh, Georgia as well, or Augusta, Georgia and Marion County. We have Granada in the, in the Caribbean, St. Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Battle Creek, Michigan, St. Louis, Missouri, Hempstead, New York, Oklahoma, Portland, Philadelphia, Sierra Leone, Houston, Richmond, and Granada in the, Saint, in the West Indies as well. So we have people tuning in from everywhere and we wanna thank you. So before we go to our... Um, online questions and comments. I just want to see if we have any questions and comrades from the comrades on the ground in St. Louis at the Uhuru House with our live audience. So uh, yeah. let's make sure we give the mic to those comrades first. Yeah. Um, Thank and, you. And I, I, want, I, want, I want us to move forward with this process, but I also want to say this, that um, I did uh, an interview, a radio interview a couple of days ago. There are 
more than 100,000 people have seen that interview, but they are blocking us here from communicating with the peoples of, of the world. They have, they're banning us in different kinds of ways. They, they have uh, this mobilization that's coming up uh, for uh, the uh, NPDM convention uh, is not even able to get out to the world using a conventional social media uh, platforms and means. This is what makes it so important. Uh, again, this is not some purely abstract discussion we're having now. You have to do everything that you can. The world must know that this convention is happening here uh, uh, in St. Louis for NPDM, uh, because this is part of not only the response that we're making, because our response is the continued struggle, escalating our struggle to be free. And NPDM offers us this vehicle, the masses of people can participate in their own struggle. So be aware of that. Be aware uh, that, uh, that uh, information that's going out about uh, the Black is Back November uh, mobilization, the March on the White House. The, this is the 14th annual March on the White House that we've organized. The rally that's going to be there in DC, the conference that usually follows this, that uh, hundreds of uh, emails are not being permitted. Uh, people are not able to, to receive them. They're bouncing back. It's clear that efforts are making, being made to make sure that this politic, this philosophy, this organization does not find expression in the world, that the people can't locate it. They only want people to hear what they want heard and not, not what it is that we have to say the African working class has to say for itself. Do everything that you can. Not only do you show up yourself, you organize in the communities where you live. You get people uh, to come to Washington, D.C. You get people now to register blackismackcoalition.org uh, for that march on the White House for that incredibly important rally. Because this has to be part of the response that we make till July 29th. The world has to, uh, and African people have to stand up in a very visible kind of way because it's a political struggle we're in. Though they are using the law against us and indictments are likely to come against us, at least at minimum indictments. The thing is, we know that it's not a legal struggle we're in. They stole weapon uh, records, documents, things like that. They are constructing now a narrative that they can develop. They're using false, uh, they're using, what do they call it? Uh, uh, fake, deep fakes and stuff like that, creating their own et cetera, and factories and laboratories they have for creating information, disseminating uh, misleading stuff. So you have to carry out your responsibility to get the word out and to get in your jalopy and to get to rent that bus or whatever's gonna get the church bus or the school bus and what have you, to get people there uh, to Washington DC, November 5th and 6th, go to blackisbadcoalition.org to get all the information you need uh, on that. And I'm just saying that it's our responsibility now, that the government has showed its hand to you and it should be helpful to you uh, that, that it's done this. It's given you an opportunity to help to, uh, to understand that you cannot rely on Zuckerberg. You cannot rely on Zuckerberg. You cannot rely on Facebook. You cannot rely on CBS or CNN or all, any of those other entities. We have to do it. We have to get off our butts and, and take responsibility for our struggle and for the future of our children in our Africa. So I want to say that. Uh, Comrade Mwezi, we can go to the questions and discussion. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Yes, right on. All right. So, yeah, any questions on the ground? Uhuru, Uhuru can, can I be heard? Yeah, if you want to stand there, I can stand right here. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Uhuru, Uhuru, um, Chairman, um, I really, and comrades that's in the audience and comrades in the world, brothers and sisters, um, I really want to appreciate the political education. And last night we were in the meeting, Chairman, you know, for the continuation of the intensive that we were involved in before July 29th. You know, we were on the right trajectory, you know, um, our party under your leadership, you know, they called this intensive that we had touched. Um, I don't want to get to the numbers, <laughs> yeah. trying to say how many houses we had touched, but we were in the meeting last night and we said, we call in this campaign, I don't even know if it's appropriate, but we said they got us effed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, they got us effed up. You know, like we have to continue the fight. And so I just really wanted to salute and appreciate just what you said. But um, why I had came up, I wanted to say that um, 
what you did in this political education and just laid out and have been doing for the African working class is, you know, educate beyond what the colonized could ever do. Because if they are the ones that's educating us and telling us about Hitler and telling us about um, socialism and telling, um, trying to um, sum up um, our reality, then we always going to have, um, never have the interest of the African working class. And so that was very clear that like, you know, our kids sit in history, we sit in history all the time, but we know nothing um, because it has never been laid out in a way that helped us to be able to see ourselves and project our future for ourselves. So I really wanted to appreciate, you know, um, your tireless leadership that does that, that um, just using myself as an example, but Africans all over on this, um, that's watching right now from various different places is evidence of the African working class coming into political life and being able to sit and hear um, history for the first time, feel like a lot of times the first time you know, uh, where I could actually see myself, understand history, to be able to see a future for my children and African children um, all over the world. And as I was coming here, I was um, watching, um, listening to, um, you know, um, a radio station that is an African radio station where they have these petty bourgeoisie people that um, talk about news that never project or really help African people um, understand their self. And they, um, you know, continue to have us in these um, situations where we always looking for a handout um, that is that is an EBT line. And it's completely different than what we have been engaged in on the North side. And this is why the FBI is attacking us and not attacking them because they okay with you having a book bag drive. They okay with you paying a couple of people gas bills and electric bills, mm -hmm. but they do not want you to be on the north side talking about, you know, exactly who's looting our community, why we need somebody to create a pay way to pay your bills. You know what I'm saying? We understand that these are the contradictions that African people face, but what is the to what end, which the party always deep in for our organizers and for the community to understand to not be okay with just a book bag drive. Even if we have one, we, we have taken it to another level. So I just really um, appreciate, you know, um, what we were listening, you know, hearing because it drives you to see the role of the petty bourgeoisie, you know what I'm saying, in all this that is very important to white power right now. You know what I'm saying, how the, the petty bourgeoisie playing a role and all these things that I was um, wanting to see. Cause you know, um, now what is happening is we can see for ourselves once we come into um, the party under the leadership of the African People's Social Party, we hearing things for ourselves. So it drove me to say, if you could say a little bit more about the petty bourgeoisie, like even with, you know, um, July 29th, the petty bourgeoisie will be used, I feel, you know, in a very strategic way against us, if, if not already. But I just think that this is a very, very rock, a real disgusting um, um, sector of the African working class to pay bourgeoisie and how they always play a role in these, these um, events. Oh, thank you. I mean, you're right. I mean, the, the class contradiction is something that Oh, I believe you're uh, muted, Chairman. So, yeah, there we go. Can you hear me now? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh -huh. yes, we said yes. You can hear me now. Yes, Chairman. You can be okay. heard now. <laughs> yeah, one thing is really important to understand, and you talk about uh, political line and how it has to uh, accurately reflect uh, not only the general historical basis for the contradiction, but also it has to reflect uh, the uh, relations of power that exist at any given time, uh, uh, how that all articulates itself. And to the extent, uh, and this is something that many people who consider them communists and things like this, 
they haven't understood. Uh, we are oppressed as a nation of people throughout the world, African people are. Uh, and so the whole nation has to be liberated. Uh, uh, the whole nation has a stake in ending the colonial domination of our people. But that means something different to different sectors of the nation. The African petty bourgeoisie can be against colonialism on the one hand, or direct uh, rule by the colonizer on the one hand, uh, but see a solution not in overturning the system that liberates the whole people of the working class, but something that would liberate them, like to have voting rights for them, that have the, their ability to get elected, uh, for their ability to get contracts uh, in the city where, you know, by the government, uh, to have favorable treatment for them, or even uh, they can even envision uh, independence where they will take the role of the white power, white people, colonizers, and keep in place more or less the same system that we suffer from. So that's an absolute, that's the reality. But the whole nation is oppressed, uh, the whole nation. <clears throat> so it's the role of the advanced detachment, the vanguard, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the forces uh, of the African People's Socialist Party to lead the struggle of the whole nation. But we lead the struggle of the whole nation uh, in a way uh, that is designed to make sure that the outcome, the to what end, is the total destruction of the social system uh, and the liberation of the African working class and the leadership of the African working class. Because it's the working people who produce all the value. There's no petty bourgeois, there's no professor, there's no bank stockbroker, there's no uh, 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 you know, big shot uh, that's responsible for producing value. It's working people who do that. The working people do that and then after we do all the labor and what have you everything that's owned is owned privately by uh, somebody else so we have the the working class has to have to lead it, lead this entire struggle so the african petty bourgeoisie left to his own devices as a social force will always betray the revolution as a social force but there are elements uh, within the african petty bourgeoisie uh, that can be won uh, to betray uh, the interests of the petty bourgeoisie and to adopt uh, the interests of the African working class as their own. And uh, it's the responsibility of the party uh, to move uh, with uh, tactics and strategies and uh, uh, to move with science <clears throat> so that in leading the struggle for the total liberation of our people, we have access to the energy of all of the vast majority of the African nation that's being colonized on the one hand, but on the other hand, making sure that this energy is directed in a way that would bring the African working class to power to preside over a liberated uh, Africa and African people. And when you look at uh, the role of the petty bourgeoisie, uh, for example, I, I just mentioned uh, the, the four-star general, uh, the African four-star general, uh, for the Marines, as an African, they need to do that. They, <clears throat> just like here, they're not fighting, the U.S. is not fighting against African people and the working class when they attack us, they're fighting Russia. So what they've done is they give a four-star general, Negro, a fourth star, hooray. And all of the African petty bourgeoisie is salivating because uh, uh, there but by the grace of God go I. And their children might also be able to be four-star generals. Then this is something they can salute on the one hand. So now you have this four-star general leading the charge in control of the efforts to keep Africa locked down under attack and fighting against Africans and against other people who are trying to be free. Uh, but it's not actually the white power that's doing this as a black man who is a four-star general who's leading this struggle against us. It's necessary for colonialism. It can't rule in the same old way, which is testimony to also uh, to uh, the decline of the system. Look at who the guy who uh, is the so-called Secretary of Defense for the United States. First time in history, a black man is the Secretary of Defense of the United States, which says something about the centrality of the question 
of Africa to everything that's going on in the world because the black man leads the fight against the Russians, against the Chinese, anybody else who's in current is, uh, is, is moving in on what used to be the absolute control of white power uh, and also responsible for killing black people uh, in Africa who are trying to be free. This is the context within which all of this stuff must be understood. And I'm hoping that through my, my too long uh, response to what you said, I'm hoping that it helps clarify the significance of the advanced attachment, the revolutionary party that has brought science, uh, uh, brought a scientific analysis uh, to the struggle that we're involved in. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru Chairman, and thank you for that question, uh, President Kalambayi. Uh, do we have any other, uh, maybe we can take a few more questions on the ground and then we have a lot of questions in the um, comments from online and I don't know if to the mob, but we do want to. Um... Uhuru comrades, is, it sounds like maybe that's it for the on ground. I'm... Wait a minute, is that it for if people here? Okay, yeah. You said People yes. Pointing. I don't know what's being pointed out. Online, online. Okay. Okay, so we can move to some online questions. Just in unity um, with, with this interest study. And uh, let's uh, streamline through some of these questions, Chairman, and some of this you have already addressed. We have questions just, um, this, is, this one is from Director Tafari. Um, which says here, uh, can you say why we cannot define this recent attack as I'm laid that out as well, Chairman. Um, but uh, and there was also a question about Pan Africanism hold versus on, African internationalism. So I, yeah, yeah, I didn't understand. I, you broke up a part of this, but I wanted to say, um, sure. uh, you know, without having heard or understood what uh, Comrade Tafari said, Comrade Tafari. Uh, is the leader of our work uh, on the continent of Africa. And he is the chair of the African People's Socialist Party in South Africa, occupied Zania. And uh, what should be clear, and part of the point that I'm trying to make is that the attack on, the, on my home uh, on July 29th, the attack on the home of our deputy chair, the attack on the uh, residence of uh, our uh, director of agitation propaganda in St. Petersburg, Florida, our offices, the attack on uh, the Solidarity Center uh, in South uh, St. Louis is an attack on Africa. That's something should be clear. I mean, we came uh, out of our third plenary, if I'm not mistaken, uh, having declared that that the way we are moving and defining ourselves, this is before any of this happened, uh, as uh, 50 years of relentless struggle, 50 years of relentless struggle for the redemption of Africa, not for the redemption of North St. Louis, not for the redemption of South St. Petersburg, for Africa. And that the, what the African People's Socialist Party has done, that's made manifest by this question from Comrade Tafari, uh, in South Africa, where the, uh, the uh, power is infrequent, uh, where the internet uh, connections are uh, disrupted on a regular basis. Uh, what we are seeing is that the African People's Socialist Party, uh, uh, the most uh, complex and complete uh, response to the oppression of African people, the exploitation of African people, the theft of our resources, uh, since Marcus Garvey more than 100 years ago. We are the African People's Socialist Party, not just an idea. We are not Pan-Africanists. I know that something has come out, what's the difference between us and Pan-Africanism? Well, let the Pan-Africanists, uh, if they continue to exist, explain their own reality. We are African internationalists. Uh, we uh, move from uh, scientific assessment and scientific analysis. We, we believe uh, in uh, the general principles of historical materialism uh, as the means through which we examine how human history has moved and it has taught us the centrality of Africa. It also helps us to understand that we are one African nation. We have uh, taken control of our definition for ourselves and definitions are not innocent. People define things uh, 
uh, uh, more or less accurately, uh, depending on their own uh, subjective interests, their own material interests. That's how a subjective, when you see a definition, you see a subjective reflection that's more or less accurate uh, of someone's uh, understanding and explanation of their own material interests. So, so we are materialists. And we take control and command of definitions based on our aspirations and needs and the objective reality that we are confronted with as African people. So we're not Pan-Africanists. We, uh, Pan-Africanism is not, not a theory, it's not an ideology. Uh, at best, it's an aspiration. Uh, and we, when you talk about the oppression of black people, you are not just talking about black people, you're talking about the world because Africans do not exist in isolation from the rest of the world. If you don't have an explanation, of the world that uh, of, of ourselves that places us in the context of the world uh, uh, where we are right now in history and what where it is that we are moving in history you don't really have theory you just have a, a snapshot and and we're not talking about a snapshot that can explain something as it currently exists uh, there's a basis for it Etc. So I've overtalked that, but uh, I just appreciate the presence of Comrade Tafari and uh, the ability to talk about being African internationalists and recognizing that the African nation is something that's exploding right now, trying to uh, uh, consolidate itself. And the African People's Socialist Party is leading that struggle. It's a big weight that we have voluntarily picked up to carry for the emancipation of our people, no matter where we exist on the planet Earth. We've done that voluntarily. We've done it recognizing that we're up against a vicious system that's beheaded people, that's cut up people and, and put them in acid vats and burn them and then, <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, give us uh, a reward of a single tooth. Uh, like with Lumumba, that uh, people are able to have a funeral to bury his tooth. And this is from civilized uh, uh, Belgium and civilized, which is, which is 80 times smaller than Congo that they had the temerity to claim that was theirs uh, and uh, against our people where so much brutality was committed. And I want us to remember, we can talk about the 11 to 15 million Africans that were killed in Congo by Leopold alone, but Congo was not the only place they were killing us. And that's really important for us to understand that we are one people and uh, they were killing us by the millions all over the world, including inside the United States. And that's the thing that we intended to end. And that's the future. Uh, our negation of that process is to build a future uh, for freedom and liberation for African people and for the peoples on the planet Earth. And that's why they attacked my house on July 29th. They want to end that. And they don't want me to talk about it to anybody. I'm supposed to be so frightened now uh, so that this discussion cannot happen. But the fact of the matter is, it's precisely because they do this kind of stuff that I have to talk, that you have to talk, that we have to organize. We cannot be frightened into submission. The fact that we live under sudden domination that would kill us and kill our wives and children and keep us living in poverty and misery, uh, uh, distorting uh, our personalities uh, under this uh, kind of oppression. That's the evidence of why we must fight. We must struggle. We cannot bow down to this. And that's why there must be an advanced detachment uh, vanguard uh, a general staff uh, for the liberation of our people that uh, we see existing in the form of the African People's Socialist Party. I know we don't have much time left, Comrade Mwesi, but I, I'm open, Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. No, thank you, uh, Chairman. In, in you giving that response, you were able to address some other questions. And one of the questions was around, you know, if we have a revolutionary party or a group in Africa, and we had Director Tafari who gave this question and you gave this overview. So I want to really appreciate this, Chairman. And we do have time for some more questions. So um, this question is coming from Comrade Sayero on Facebook. And he's saying, Uhuru, Chairman O'Malley, can you explain the seriousness of the assault on us through genocide as it is in Puerto Rico and other colonized countries right here in the US, please? Okay, I'm not quite sure I understood the Puerto Rico reference, but the point that I would make is this, that Puerto Rico itself is a consequence of colonialism. I mean, everything that the white world has, everything, there's not a single thing, not an, even an idea in their heads that did not come as a consequence of, of colonial assault on the rest of us. And the thing is they appropriate what is ours and they rename it and call it their own. I'm, I'm sometimes disgusted by African people, some of whom call themselves nationalists and what have you, 
who would talk about how Africans in the United States and other places we've lost our culture, except we haven't lost our culture. The thing is that our culture is ubiquitous. There's no place in the world you can go, a few places in the world where you won't see expressions of African culture. The thing is that they call it, uh, they call it Jamaican culture or they call it Brazilian culture or they call it the first, uh, the, the, the only true American music is jazz. They, 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 they have us you know, running uh, uh, in, in marathons and, and, uh, and they call it a victory by, by England or France or in the, the Olympics and stuff like that. That's Africa. We are so ubiquitous everywhere that we don't even recognize our culture as our own, even when we're looking at it, because it's been renamed, reclassified, et cetera. So uh, uh, I, I just think it's really uh, important to, to understand that. So the whole notion of Puerto Rico uh, is Spanish speaking Africans for the most part, Spanish speaking Africans throughout the Americas and what have you, all a part of the colonial mode of production that extracts value from us <laughs> killing indigenous populations in various places of the world, stealing their land, stealing their resources, stealing their science and genius, et cetera, appropriating and put, locking it up in vaults that they call universities that we can access around the white world, museums that we can access. I was in Belgium uh, with Kermit, uh, Secretary General of the African Social International, Louise Kinshasa, and we're going to a museum in Belgium. And he said for the first time uh, he ever saw a, a, a knife that was manufactured by Africans from Congo was in a museum in Belgium. So Africans have to leave Africa to go to France, to go to Belgium, to go to other places, even to see our own genius, et cetera. Uh, we are everywhere. We are ubiquitous. And what they call Puerto Rico uh, is theft of indigenous land uh, that's been labeled on by African people under the he hegemon of uh, Spanish speaking colonizers. And I'm, wanted, I'm glad to be able to say that because I want to say this also, because people make a mistake, like uh, especially in our communities, uh, 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 people uh, see uh, Puerto Rican, Mexicans and stuff like that and call them Spanish. And then they use this term in the United States about Hispanics. Uh, the fact is Hispanic is of Spain and Spain is a white country and Spain uh, uh, somehow gets disappeared in this discussion. Uh, because you're looking at Puerto Rico, you're looking at Cuba, you're looking at so many other places where people speak Spanish, but they speak Spanish as a consequence of Spain, a white country coming, colonizing people, just like I speak English as a consequence of the white man coming to Africa, kidnapping me, and then dropping me off here. But I got relatives who they dropped off also in Haiti, and they dropped what they call Haiti in other places who speak other languages, right, because of colonial domination. So. Uh, I just think it's really important to say that the Hispanic uh, is a lie. It's in Spain. And, in, and, and even that's problematic given the history of Spain and Africa with Spain uh, uh, and what they call Portugal and Iberia, et cetera, black people's presence there for a long period of time. So that's just a false notion uh, about the Hispanics, uh, you know, uh, uh, et cetera, and the African-Americans and all of this other nonsense. I talked to, is there anyone else coming at um, Mwazi? Yes, Chairman. Uh, thank you so much for that. And thank you for your comrade, uh, question, Comrade Sayero. Just a note, yes. I'm gonna keep my camera off because I know I've been having some connection issues. So, but I do wanna just really appreciate what you said, Chairman, around, um, you know, we haven't lost our culture. And, and the problem is that, you know, it's not that we don't produce, but that we don't, we aren't able to transform, you know, what we produce and we don't co control the means of production. And this, and your, your response kind of led into this other question um, that, um, is here by uh, The Truth on uh, YouTube. And uh, this person says, how will we develop Africa without capitalism? I think us Africans got enslaved and colonized because we didn't produce enough technology. How will we defend ourselves without a capitalist system? That's, that's and, good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is the truth. You don't know the truth. Uh, the truth is that capitalism was developed not through the genius of white people, but what they stole from the rest of us. There are whole histories of Napoleon going uh, into Egypt and taking all kinds of scientists with him. So there used to be a time where it was stated openly in France that French society was based on Egyptian, uh, uh, on, on Egyptian culture and what have you. Uh, 
which is of course, uh, you know, an exaggeration. But the fact is that the science and genius that they have claimed for themselves is science and genius that comes from Africa and African people and other colonized people around the world. It's, it's not that capitalism is good, wouldn't be any capitalism. We had societies that were not based on private ownership of the collective endeavors of the rest of the society as, as European, this, this is a European tradition. It comes from a, a specific history of Europe uh, that, is, that is also made manifest in structures that were created, economic structures to facilitate this uh, process. So the fact is that capitalism doesn't, doesn't provide uh, development, it provides undevelopment. It is an attack on the development of Africa. That's what it is to say that capitalism is missing and that's why we are not successful is to say that, that the white man is responsible for development and you can't development if, if the white, it's another way of saying that. The, the reality is just the opposite, is that everything they have in terms of science, they stole from us, uh, uh, et cetera. And so we will develop, not only will we develop without capital, uh, without capitalism, we're going to destroy capitalism as a part of the process of development. That's where you see development beginning to occur. That's what's happening in North St. Louis. That's what Black Power Blueprint is all about. That's what all the other economic endeavors that we create, the furniture stores in, in, in Oakland and the furniture store in Philadelphia and the marketplaces where African people can come and begin to circulate capital among ourselves. That's a part of the process uh, that threatens the existence of the capitalism that the truth uh, is now uh, assuming to be responsible for progress when it does just the opposite. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, thank you so much for that. Um, so we have just about just under 10 minutes left and I am want to take one more question here, Chairman. Uh, this question comes from Comrade Diop and I want to just really appreciate this overview, Chairman, because you have summed this up, but sometimes, you know, uh, might be helpful to reiterate um, so the masses can, you know, take this in and internalize what you're saying. And this question comes from Comrade Diop on Facebook. He says, can you say what the Marxist definition of the point of production is and how African internationalism defines it, if at all? And what manner yeah. should the point of production, yeah, be yeah, addressed at various stages of the struggle? Uhuru Chairman. Yeah, so the Marxists have defined a certain process uh, through uh, how that human you know, society has developed and uh, uh, they talk about uh, how wage labor is like one of the fundamental components of uh, capitalist society. And the point of production is where human beings work like in the factories and other places and where uh, so-called surplus uh, uh, of value is created through labor. It's the point of production. This is the fundamental point. This is where profit comes from. Many people think profit comes as a consequence when they mark it up in the store. When you go in there, they marked it up and that's what profit. Profit is called surplus value. This is value beyond uh, the, the, the entity that you're purchasing. And this value comes as a consequence of value of stolen labor power, right? That's the point of production. What we are saying is by the time it gets to the factory, by the time you get to Detroit, where you used to be able to make all those cars, black people have been in these mines, uh, digging up uh, all of these resources uh, that, that get to the factories. And before you get to the point of production, it's the point of the bayonet held by the colonizer that gets our resources to the point of production. So the contradiction is not the fundamental contradiction. Yes, there's exploitation at the point of production, if you will, on top of the exploitation of African people, there's exploitation of white people and others on top of that. But the basic fundamental contradiction is at the point of the bayonet, the theft of our land, our resources, our genius that's been uh, uh, talked about uh, a moment ago, not at the point of production. That's not the fundamental contradiction. So that's what we're talking about. So are we saying that you don't struggle in the interest of workers who are being exploited? The point? Yeah, you struggle around that too. But what we do understand that the fundamental contradiction existing in the world is that which exists between oppressed and oppressor nations, between the colonized and the colonizer. And that every other contradiction that exists is one that uh, revolves around this fundamental contradiction that to get to the essence of the question, attack the fundamental contradiction. Sometimes you can only get to the fundamental contradictions through dealing with these other kinds of questions, but you always deal with these other questions 
recognizing that the essence, that you have to get to the essence if you're ever gonna solve it. Otherwise it's opportunism. And the labor movement in the world essentially has been opportunistic because it hasn't been one that's designed uh, the, to overturn the colonial relationship. It's just to get more benefits uh, existing on top of a platform of colonial exploitation and oppression. Uhuru. Hope that was helpful comment, Dia. Uhuru, Chairman Des, that was very helpful. And um, well, Chairman, I just really wanna salute this incredible discussion that we've been able to have. And um, I really want to just thank the Amali Taught Me show for helping us with this production today. And, you know, it's so important to restate that in the face of these desperate state attacks that we do not retreat, that we build, and we must recommit ourselves to the struggle of African freedom and self-determination. And everyone should visit the handsoffuhuru.org website to donate to our defense committee, do an action or a press conference in your area, and sign on with the countless other comrades who have submitted their statements of support and solidarity and the condemnation of the FBI. So now, Chairman, I'd like to turn it back to you for any closing remarks. Uhuru. The closing remarks that I would have is this, that the the attack on our movement, my home, uh, and our offices uh, is part of a slander campaign. It's not they're going to use the law, it's their law. And the law is their opinion. Whatever their opinion is the law, that's the damn law. There's no way you can get around that. There are not enough civil tongue uh, lawyers and, and, and crumps and all of this other kind of stuff to get around that. Uh, it's their law. And if Crump ever went into a courtroom where he had to fight against the colonial mode of production, against colonialism, uh, it'd be clear, uh, as opposed to now where every time an African gets killed, he hits the lottery. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's really important uh, to understand that these charges are slander. It's not because we committed any kind of offense except to attack the colonial domination of Black people. It's the colonial domination of black people that killed George Floyd. It's the colonial domination of black people that killed Mike Brown. It's the colonial domination of black people that killed this, this young woman uh, in Kentucky and all of the murders that, that they committed against us. That's, that's what the struggle is about. So it's slanderous, all the charges that they make against us. And I'm telling you that the best thing that we do is bring light to this darkness. They want to create this notion of this insidious kind of Russian connected group that's somehow working in the shadows to bring down this wonderful America that was built by black. This is the house that black built when you talk about America. I just think it's really important. I'm inviting everybody, go and support this campaign to uh, in defense, go to, uh, 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 to uh, the website that set up Hands Off Uhuru, do that. But come to St. Louis. It's an open invitation. See for yourself. Yeah. There's no secret here. We are transparent. You see murals on the wall. You see whole communities being transformed. You see doulas being created so that Black women can have safe births in a city where, where every year enough Black babies die in the first year of life to fill 15 kindergarten classes. Come to St. Louis. See what we've done to transform this African community. Come to see our, our economic enterprises and things like that to our, 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 in, in Philadelphia and in St. Petersburg, Florida. Come and see it. And this is your response. This has to be part of your response to this situation. Come to the convention that the court, that uh, uh, NPDOM is having here uh, uh, in St. Louis uh, in the next couple of weeks. Is it a couple of weeks? Yeah. Next what? The, the, the third, yeah, come, come, come to St. Louis. And uh, so I just want to say that and to thank everybody, uh, all of you comrades for being here and being you know, consistent in the work uh, and they scared of you. Uh, that's the thing, I'm just an 81 year old black man out here, it is, this is not me, it's you that they're afraid of and this is my connection with you that they're afraid of and I recognize that and you must recognize that as well. Thank you, Vanguard up. Relentless. Well, I just want to salute 
the brilliant leadership of Chairman Omalia Shatella and really uh, send a huge thank you to everybody who, ten, who tuned in. So make sure to follow Chairman on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of Omali Taught Me Sunday Study. Bring the Chairman to your city, your campus, your organization, and donate to the Defense Committee. And we say hands off Uhuru. Hands off. Hands off. Yeah.